Okay, so we've talked about the life cycle of a machine learning project. We've talked about how to pick projects. You know, what are the different sort of high-level categories of projects? And um, now I want to talk about a couple of things that are um, that are important to do before you get your project started. Um, the first of which is picking a metric to optimize. Um, the key points here are, you know, the real world is messy. You usually care about a lot of things, but for a machine learning system, it typically works best um, when you know the machine learning engineers are trying to drive a single number down um, or up. And so as a result, you need some way of combining all the things that you care about. And um, this is something that you're going to pick at the beginning of your project, and it can and will change. Um, and so just to, to quickly review um, the difference between accuracy, precision, and recall, if you have um, you know, confusion matrix that compares um, when the answer was actually no and when you predicted it was no, then um, the accuracy is the percentage that you get correct. Um, the precision is the number of true positives, so the number of times that you predicted true and it's actually true divided by all the positives. And then the recall is the number of true positives um, divided by the number of times that the answer was actually yes. Um, and so, you know, why is it important to choose a single metric? Well, suppose that we're comparing three models and trying to decide which is best, and they have these different precision and recall numbers. Right, so which of these models do we actually pick? It's not obvious from this chart. Um, and so there's a number of different strategies that you can use to combine metrics. You can just average them, um, right? And so if we do that, then here um, model three would jump out as being the best. Um, another strategy that I see a lot is where you actually pick one metric to optimize on and then just set threshold levels for the rest of them. So we really care about accuracy, but we need our model to be able to run predictions in this amount of time. And as long as it's better than this amount of time, then that's fine. Um, so I think, you know, how do you choose which ones to threshold and which ones to optimize? Um, sort of domain judgment. Um, but you can also think about, you know, which of the metrics tend to be least sensitive to model choice. So you want to optimize the ones that are more sensitive to model choice. And then which ones are already the closest to the desirable values. So a lot of times if you have, you know, three metrics, one of them is really bad and two of them are good you might threshold the good ones and optimize the bad one. And then choosing the value at which to threshold, you know, the, again, a lot of this is downstream, uh, domain judgment about you know, what is the tolerance that you need in order to solve the downstream problem. Um, but you can also look at things like you know, how well does the baseline model do um, and how important is this metric to us right now. Right? So if our baseline is already doing really well, then we can say, like, OK, that's, you know, We'll, we'll, set the, we'll set the threshold better. We want to do better than the baseline. Um, and then if the metric is really important, um, then you might choose sort of a stricter threshold for that, for that metric. And so an example here is we might say, um, you know, we'll pick the model that has the best precision at um, a recall of better than 0 0.6. And if we do that, then uh, model two will jump out as the best. And then there are also sort of more complex or domain-specific formula. So you know, for precision and recall, there's a metric called the mean average precision. And what this means is if you plot um, the trade-off between precision and recall, so as you, um, as you increase the recall, you, the precision decreases. Um, and then you look at the area under that curve, and that gives you the average precision. And the mean average precision, precision is just the average of the average pre uh, precision taken over all of the classes that you're doing prediction on. Um, and so, you know, the example here is if we look at mean average precision, then, you know, maybe model one will jump out as being best here. So, you know, to come back to our running example, um, we, so the way we might choose our metrics for this example are, you know, we would start by enumerating the requirements. So again, our downstream goal is to do real-time grasping. And we know that we need less than one centimeter of position error, but we don't really know exactly what, whether it's 0 0.5 or 0 0.25 centimeters. Um, and you know, we, similarly, like, we know that we have to have like, less than 5 degree angular error, and it has to run in less than 100 milliseconds to work in real time. Right, so like, let's say these are our requirements. Then what I would do is I would go and look at how well we're doing right now, so how well our baselines are doing. And so I might just train a few models. And um, what I would do is compare the current performance against the requirements. 
So like, let's say that our models have a position error somewhere between 0 0.75 and 1.25 centimeters, depending on you know, our choice of hyperparameters. But all of the angular errors are around 60 degrees, right? so very, very far off. Um, and the inference time is 300 milliseconds, right? so it's, um, it's too slow still. Um, and so the conclusion I would draw from this is you know, our, our angular error is, ter is uh, terrible. So let's prioritize making that closer to meeting our requirements. Um, and then, you know, again, we're, not, we're really not sure exactly what type of position error we need in order for this system to be useful, but it seems to be doing relatively well already. So I'm just going to threshold that error at one centimeter. So I'm going to throw out any models that have worse than one centimeter position error. And then I think the last decision I would probably make here is to ignore runtime for now. Right? So our, um, we're, we're nowhere near being accurate enough for this model to work. And so let's prioritize making that happen, and then we'll figure out how to make it run in real time. Um, and then the last thing that I would do is, you know, just as the numbers improve, so as the angular error gets closer to, um, to what we need it to be, then I would revisit that metric and start to incorporate things like inference time. Okay, so to summarize, you know, the real world is messy. You care about a lot of metrics, but you need to pick one. Um, and so you can, there are a lot of different ways of picking a formula to combine metrics, and that formula will change as your project goes on. All right, I'll take uh, a couple questions. So, yeah, what's an invalid metric? An example of an invalid metric. An example of an invalid metric. Um, yeah, I mean, I think metrics are like, metrics measure sort of the things that you care about your model performing well on, right? So if you, um, if you pick a, uh, so the, I guess there's two ways that a metric could be invalid. Either it doesn't correspond to something that you care about, or it doesn't actually measure anything, right? So like, um, for example, I think um, you see this a lot in sort of um, in generative model applications where, you know, what you really care about is like, um, you care about how good the image looks that you're generating. So you care about how realistic the face is that your model generates. But that's not a valid metric because you can't really measure that other than by having sort of humans look at it and provide some, uh, some judgment. So that would be an example of an invalid metric. How do you look at projects where the satisficing metrics are a higher priority than simple optimizing metrics? Mm -hmm. So it's more important, for example, to eliminate bias from the system than to be more accurate in your yeah. predictions. Um, so I think there's, um, I think you want to think about, in the example of bias, you want to think about how, how am I actually going to measure whether the system is biased or not? And I think that's going to come down to how do we create data sets where we can use this data set to detect bias? So if we have a, you know, a category of things that we want to make sure that we perform well on, then let's have a data set for that category and let's measure the performance of our model um, on that category. And then I think typically what I would do is probably try to set some threshold value and say like, yeah, you know, I care about the difference in performance between this category that I don't want to be biased against and my average performance um, or something like that. And we'll talk more about how to sort of use data sets to create tests in um, a later lecture. And the follow-up question is, how can we reduce the biases in the model when working on a human-in-the-loop project, and ex like, e.g. ML recommendation engines? Mm -hmm. um, how could, so I think, like, in general, the way I would think about reducing bias is, um, again, I would try to, find, um, I would try to find examples that serve as tests for your model to see for yourself whether the model is, is biased or not. Right. And so then if you detect some bias in the model because it performs poorly on a particular category of things, um, then the way I would address that is I would go back to the, tra uh, to the training data collection problem. And I would say, you know, how can we collect more training data that, is, um, that allows the model to be trained on things that will help it perform better on the categories that it's biased against? <laughs>